So, Mike, let's get right into it. This Roy Jones fight. Yes, yes. I know, and I see, you know, but yeah, I, is it really going to go down? It's down, man. It's happening. I was thinking today, I think, God damn, this shit really going down. It's really getting weird. close now. Yeah, I took my phone, I cut my phone off, put it away. And that made me, this is it, no more calls, no more calls. I don't hear nobody, I don't hear shit. Mm. I don't want to talk to nobody about shit. Mm. And it's on. Fight time. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling. As a professional, you used to doing three minute rounds. We spar three minute rounds in here. Right, right, but in the fight, they say you're gonna fight two minute rounds. It only takes two seconds to knock somebody out. Two seconds. Out. 100%, 100%. I don't need the whole three. What the hell you need? need so basically, you don't need the whole three. Most of my fights, most of my fights are under two minutes. Most of my knockouts are under two minutes anyway. True, true. Most of the ones that are in the first round are under two minutes anyway. We both from Brownsville. Tell me a good Brownsville story. Brownsville story? Yeah. Um, I can remember this. In Brownsville, um, we play in the bad in the buildings. We don't got no, have any parks. We, we, um, we take um, dresser drawers and stack them up and we put a mattress down and we do flips off the right. dresser to the mattress. Or else we would make our own. We didn't have big wigs. We'd make our own big wigs. We'd take one two by four, put it out there, another shorter one, bang nails in there, put a wheel on this one, put a wheel on this one, then go to the back, bang two wheels on that one, get a, a rope or a belt tied around the, the two wheels, and then have somebody push you down the hill and you just ride down the hill. And we made our own little big wheel. That's wheels. a go kart. Yeah, then you know we did Scully. Did you play Scully? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we played play Scully. Scully. We played in abandoned buildings all the time. Mm -hmm. And every time we forget, we play and we step on a nail. It, it never fails. You always step on a nail. Got to go to the and doctor and get the shot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, it happened to you always. Oh, because we don't have parks to play. And if you do, people are shooting in. They were shooting in the 70s too when I was a little kid, you mm -hmm. know? They were shooting in the 70s. I think growing up, I got like four of them technical shots too. Like yeah. was, that was normal. Band the building, we didn't Step play. Step on the nail, you, yeah. And nice sort of merry-go-round parks, like you see my kids play. My kids, wow! I used to. I mean, I give the grace of God, thank God, to have mercy on me that my children weren't born where I was born at. Exactly. I couldn't protect them. Isn't it how lucky our children are that they they haven't seen what we what we see? Lucky and they're blessed. And fortunate too because. Mm -hmm. They never have what we have. Don't care how much education they have. Don't care how much luxury they have. They're never going to have that instinct that we have. Mm. It keeps us alive. Mm. They're not smart enough to say yes to somebody that they should say yes to. Mm. A sir or ma'am that they should say sir or ma'am to. These things like that, they're smart, you know, and their education, that'll make them some money, but their instincts keep them alive. Mm. That's why though, if guys like me, they, they can never be like me and you. Because we, in a way, we protect them from that. So, Mike, tell me, what is one of the worst crimes you've seen done in Brownsville? I mean, yes, I mean, you know, I'm from Brownsville. It's bad stuff. I don't know. <laughs> it's bad stuff. It's really bad stuff. People tying people up and doing bad things to them over drugs and stuff to their family members. It's real mm -hmm. bad stuff that you don't even want to mention. You know, you know, it's bad. Brownsville. Anything you can think of, someone did to abuse to abuse a human being. They did it there. They did it there. You know, I'm the product of fear. I'm a scary guy because I, I grew up there. Mm. If I, listen, I don't care being Mike Tyson, the toughest guy, better, all that is bullshit. If I wasn't able to, saw, to see what I saw in, saw in Browns, there's no way I could have been able to be the person I am today. Mm. You know, I know this is, this what, this is what happened. It, it, this is just what happened. It might happen to me 10 minutes from now. When I finish this interview with you, this is what happened. You know, once we're born, our process of dying starts right there. Rapper You Got from Wu Tang Clan yes. said that he's from Brownsville. Back in the days, he said that his mother was robbed on Pickin Avenue and her errands were snatched. And he seems to believe that you was the guy that did it. You say that Mike Tyson ran up on your mom and took her earrings out of her ears? Yeah. And you were there? Yeah. Do you actually remember? I was, baby, like, I, was, I was a baby, man. I was probably like about eight years old, eight, nine years old, man. Do you have any thought or, or remembrance about anything like that or? Well, his name you got? Yeah. Well, you tell you got, I got the money to pay him back now. So when he sees me, tell him to ask for the money and I'll give it to him. That's a gentleman and a scholar right there. <laughs> no joke. If I snatch your mother's earrings, that means you have more money than me. You know? Facts, facts, facts. Growing up as a kid, I wanted, like, I, 
we, we know, you know, you move to the cat skills and, you know, you move a cuss, but when or did cuss ever become your league, legal guardian? Yes, he did. When I was um, maybe 16 or 17, when I was old enough because my mother had died and he had to get my mother's um, signature before she died and she did. Mm. And my mother just couldn't understand why I wanted to stay with these white people. <laughs> she thought that she wasn't good enough. She was really hurt by that. And I went to my mother's house, and I've never been nothing but trouble to my mother. Oh, she always went to court, all the, uh, not the court, but went to precincts all hour at night to get me out of precincts. Yes, for the, all my life since I was like 12, 12 years old, that she's been doing that. Since what, nine to 12, she's been doing that. Mm. Then I have no interest in doing anything. Then go to school, yes, rob people, snatch people's chain, breaking my mother's neighbor's houses, rob my mother's boyfriend. It's just, it's really trash. Anything that, some little slimy little ten year old kid can do can would do breaking your breaking your, your mother's friend's house do just do stuff people that come over and see your mother huh your friend got the check they just got that check they're drinking their party and then I go in my window go in the back fire skate go in her house and rob a house and um, that's just what I was that's mm-hmm. the product of what that was my mother that's just that's just what it was my mother and father was in the in the street life they were sex workers and that's just what it was that's just it's just what it was everything mm-hmm. goes. Mm. Everything goes. Everything goes. Mm. So, Mike, at 18 years old, you fought a fighter by the name of Hector Mercedes. That's, yeah, that's my first pro fight, yeah. Tell me about that. Um, I was real nervous and scared. But I know it was a guy that um, they wanted me to win. I, I just understand how the process goes. They're going to give me some fights that easy and they build me up as good as I get. I understand how that go. But I just wanted to keep fighting because I wanted to reach a higher level. Mm-hmm. Couldn't wait, wait to get the high. My, my head was so souped up that I wanted to tell you this story. After I started training in the box, my mother didn't sign me over yet. I met the legal box. I came back, my mother never said, I said, Mom, Ma, I just met these guys, these white guys upstate. I'm going to be champ of the world and I'm going to be the youngest champ of all. And my mother started looking at me. I said, Mom, I just knocked out 10 guys. I'm the junior Olympic champion of this whole country. Mom, I'm going to be the world champ. I'm going to have millions of dollars, girl. I'm going to buy you a house. So my mother looked at me. And the only thing she knows from me is stealing money from her. her boy, it's being a scumbag. That's all she know about my son. He can't be trusted. And all of a sudden, she hears me talking with confidence. And then she said, they can't imagine that she told me this. She said, don't forget about Joe Lewis, because she was a teenager in Joe Lewis time. Don't remember, Joe Lewis underestimated somebody and got knocked out. There's always somebody better. I said, Ma, see, the person you're talking about is always better. That's me. I'm the one that's better than me. And my mother wouldn't pick, I said, Ma, read my magazine. They're writing my, my mother wouldn't pick up the magazine. She gave me my phone. So I read it later. Went in the back. She was so embarrassed. She said, my, I had such a big ego. Mm. That was the last time I really got to talk to my mother. Then she quickly went in a coma stroke. But she didn't like my attitude. Mm. She, she couldn't, she thought it was, I don't know, maybe I was being conceited. But that was confidence to me. I looked at it as a form of confidence. I had no idea I was being ignorant. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about egotism. I was getting the ego, developing one, but I didn't know what the ego was. Right. And it came out. I couldn't control it. It just came out and my mother didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Deep. Good. And I, I was getting in trouble all the time. In the face, I could say, oh, I liked them better the other way. You know? When I was getting locked up, throwing my life away. So, champ. You had 15 bouts in your first year. Yes. I mean, you was fighting about every three to two weeks. Yes. Two and a half years, every two weeks. I mean, so after your, after your first knockout, what were your thoughts, like, like going into your second fight? I want to be champion of the world. That was my whole objective. I want to be champ of the world. Mm-hmm. You know, I come from Brownsville. You know, you come from Brownsville, you have a, like, a little bit of a low self-esteem. But you want to do well. Right, you want the world, yeah. So you won you won twenty six of your first twenty eight fights yeah. by KO. Yeah. Sixteen of them came in the first round. Yes. Yeah. Just yeah. putting everything to sleep. Well, um, I just wanted to be very exciting. Cuss one here designed my style to be very exciting. So he wanted to be exciting. That was my main objective. Not, Cause you know you there was guys that were had long title defenses and had the title for a long time, but you know nobody would come see them fight. They were boring. So he wanted to make sure I was exciting. And sometimes and then I took it took it too far, and I I, I was talking about punching somebody's nose and brain in their nose, and then all the good Kodak commercials just stopped. <laughs> those Kodak commercials and those Coca Cola commercials, I used to have them like, and they just stopped. Wow. Holy moly! And so, um, was cuss around then? 
I don't think he was, but that's what me and Cuss talked about. Mm. You know what I mean? He said, and even though it's not possible, you just think have the intention of putting his nose in the brain. Of course, his bone's going to break before it goes in his brain, but he just said, mm. have the intention to do that. That's your intention to do that. And that's what it was all about. Fighting is about hurting somebody with bad intentions. Inflicting the most pain. Yeah, exactly. Until he gives up. Mm. Mm. His total surrender, his total destruction. If Cuss would have remained in your life, a little bit longer, do you think that your life would have turned out a little bit different? Totally different. Totally different because Cuss was really um, controlling. Mm -hmm. Controlling, he's just, he had been very happy though, but he would have just been different. I'd have been a real, um, I would have been, um, I would have been really commercialized. Mm -hmm. You know, because Cus always wanted somebody like that. You know, he didn't care about, but he always wanted somebody that had that clean look. Mm. You know, represent people. And he, he was into all that stuff. Mm. I really was just into. Um, I, I got into my ego that I just wanted to be people and everybody look at me beating people mm. and stuff. Mm. So, so, so basically, Cus would take you somewhere else. Yeah. All right. Okay. I've been selling everything, sneakers, commercials. I've been selling the commercials. I've been selling everything. Cuss became, even though Cuss had um, socialist tendencies, mm -hmm. he was very capitalistic of the system, how to take advantage of capitalistic system you know, to help other people, use the money to help people. Mm -hmm. So did you guys do a lot of charity stuff up there? He believed in charity. Yeah, we help people when we can. We get started making money, but we're, he's a strong believer in charity. But he's a real believer in the black church and stuff. Because when he had Floyd Path and his other cha champion, that was the main power structure of the 60s back then, the black church. Hmm. 86, you was given your first title, your first title um, de um, defense against Trevor Burbick. Yeah. For the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World. Bur Burbick was the last person to fight Ali, and he hurt Ali very bad. When you fought him, was there any revenge? A hundred percent, yes, no doubt about it. <laughs> I was going to kill him. <laughs> you know, I know, saw so the way he beat. He was hitting Ali really hard with everything he had. Ali didn't have nothing left. He could have been, but he was trying to kill him. Mm. I said, "Oh, I can't wait till I get him." Him and Larry Holmes. Him and Larry. Yeah. Mm. His nephew. Did you know that his nephew killed him? I heard of the story. It was, um, it was some kind of beef over property, I believe. That's what I hear through the neighborhood, all the people that know him, I know me, and, they, and I heard it was over property. And um, I don't know what went down, but my experience with Mr. Um, Trevor Burbick and the people, he was kind of like a bully, tough guy. So you gotta be careful, you're a fighter and you're a tough guy. Mm. The, odds of, the odds of you living long is just not good. Not good, right. It's bad enough that you're a boxer or a mm. tough guy, now you're both of them? Yeah, you're not gonna be around long. Mm. Mm. Not good. World champion and a tough guy in the street? No, it's not going to happen. You're not going to have a good, long life. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Heavyweight champ, born and I'm a tough guy in the street, still I'm a bully. Burbick ended up getting murdered by his own nephew uh, at 52 years old some years later. I don't feel bad about, for him. God don't like ugly. You do ugly to think people, people, <laughs> you to come back to you. God don't like ugly. And he was ugly. He beat anybody. He beat his daughter. That, uh, let me forget about that guy because he's a sore subject. And his soul is resting. I don't know in peace or not, but it's resting. You won the title at 20 years old. You was the youngest heavyweight champion in the world. What did that feel like? Hey, listen, that was um, winning the championship at um, 20 years old, becoming the youngest champ ever. That was Cuss's dream. When he met me at 12 years old, he said he was talking to the the gentleman Bobby Stewart that introduced him, he said, are you sure this kid is 12 years old? Because I was, I was 12 years old, but I was 200 pounds. Mm. I'm 5'8", 200 pounds. He said, because they don't like to go to the real jails and stuff. So I've always been in the institution, so I've been lifted with, so I look like a man. Right, right. And so Bobby Stewart said, Bobby Stewart came back and said, tell me the truth and don't lie. How old are you? <laughs> I said, you got my, so you got my, my birth certificate. What does it say? 12. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, yeah, you're all right. And he said, look, cuz, this is the birth certificate. <laughs> this guy knew me for two years. He was asking, tell me the truth. How old are you? So they didn't believe it. Yeah, I said, Bobby, what? I'm 12. You got my birth certificate. Show it to him. 1987, you beat Tony Tucker. 
is the first time the heavyweight title has been unified ever. <laughs> what that felt like. Hey, listen, I felt so good for that fight because, listen, I'm going to tell you what happened. I, had, I, was, I was training for that fight. I trained for that fight for, like, what, four weeks. And then for some, I got really scared and paranoid. So I'm quitting boxing. And so I left for, like, um, two weeks and went drinking and party for a while. Then I came back and trained for, like, another week and a half. And then I fought him. Mm. And it went 15 or 12 rounds, but it was a tough fight. And he probably, he was a very, he was my best, he was the greatest mover. He was real confident. He knew how to do combinations. He was a real great fighter. And he unified the title and became the youngest guy to do it. How did, I mean, that was, that had to be. I, um, <laughs> that was pretty heavy for me. <laughs> it was pretty heavy. That was, <laughs> I guess, um, that was more than I was anticipating. You know, mm -hmm. I knew how it was going to be. At least I believe I know how it was going to be, but it was more right. than what I thought it was going to be. Right, right. Right. It's more than I can handle back then. I was just a kid. In '87, they, they should have never let me alone by myself. People would let me go by, go out by myself. What the hell? I come back so much people. What you was getting into? I mean, no, I'm just no. I'm just out by myself, and I'm going to Browns and hang out with friends. You and you were the champ. Yeah, it's the champ chilling. See my old <laughs> friends that that we used to hang out. But with it was with. different. It was different when you came back then. Yeah, right? no doubt about it. No doubt about it. They were so happy. In the late 80s, you had a boxing video game on Nintendo. Yeah. The, the video game was like an all-time high video game. It made like millions and millions it of dollars. It broke all the record. We're going to do another one. We're anticipating doing a new one, too. Right, right. So what is your relationship now with those guys? Well, um, they were um, discussing taking me out of Mike Tyson punch out, and, and there was a, um, a hailstorm of negative reviews for that. And so we're, we're contemplating that he's doing it with someone else. Mm -hmm. And just no one can be angry and everybody can go out separate ways happy. They gave you fifty thousand dollars for a three year deal with no royalties, but they made like one uh one point seven billion to like Hey, we that was a bad deal, but I don't think it was fifty right. G's, it was um one point two point something, something in that range. Mm -hmm. But still in all it was just a really bad deal. I didn't know anything about businesses anything. And what the hell? Right. Bad business move. In 88, you fought Larry Holmes. What was that like? Because, you know, Larry Holmes fought Ali. Uh, listen, I was um, 14 in 1980, and I went on October 2nd, I went to Albany, and I saw this on um, movie screen, Ali fight Holmes, and Ali was getting the crap beat out of him for 10 rounds. And when they stopped, everybody was crying, me, because we all got the, the movie theater, we went in the car, and it's 30 mile drive, we didn't say one word. Mm. It all hurt. You fight Muhammad Ali in the ring, and every round you're, you're dominating. And then by the 10th round, uh, Ali's trainer, Angelo Dundee, he stopped the fight, which was the first time that Ali had ever stopped a fight in his entire career. Well, did you see me, when you watch this replay on there, when, when I walked oh, yeah. walk back to my corner, I was walking back to my corner, I don't like this. What do you want to do? Let me kill the guy, huh? You know, listen, they know, Angelo Dundee knew that I could whoop Muhammad Ali, that he ain't had a chance because I was his sparring partner. I was in there every day with the man. I know how he fought. I know how he, what, if he threw it left, I knew if he threw it right. I know how he blocked his punches. He didn't have none of that. And I said, what I got to do? I don't want to kill the guy. <laughs> But I'm gonna beat on him some more, okay? And that's the way it was. And after the fight, I went to his dressing room, and he was there. You said, "I want homes. I want homes. I want homes." I said, "You don't want me no more, man. You don't want me no more." I get, went, to, grabbed him, hugged him, gave him a kiss, and said, "I said, you be the greatest, man. You always be the greatest in my book." Mm. And then they said, "You know, you got a revenge, Ali, right?" I said, "Yes." Wow. I was only 14. They put all that on me. <laughs> Then I got to revenge him. 
So Ali was like a hero to you. Big time. When you beat Larry Holmes, was that a revenge for Muhammad Ali? Well, I believe it was. For me, it was. I don't know how Ali felt about it, but mm -hmm. I felt like I avenged him. Even though that was just a childhood um, prophecy of me, I don't know. It made me feel like I was somebody that did that. I helped Ali. Like, Ali mm -hmm. needs help. I helped Ali. So I could make myself big in my own mind, I guess. In the Holmes fight, Holmes, that was the only time Holmes was knocked out in 75 fights, and you did it. Yeah, but Holmes was the older guy, and after he fought me, he fought around 20 other fights, and he did real well. He fought um, Holyfield, he fought um, uh, Oliver McCall, very close fights, and they, they couldn't beat him. The fights mm -hmm. were very close and even, and so um, he just um, did the wrong thing. He came out of retirement, out of retirement, retirement, and fought me his first fight. Mm -hmm. You know, if if he did what he did, fought 10, 15 fights, then fought fought me, the fight would turn out so much different. Tupac. Yeah. And against all odds, he made a comment about you. Rap nigga looking like Larry Holmes, Fabian and sick. When he did that verse and he came out, did you? What did you? Um, was that verse about you? Yeah. It, no, it was just about. He knew I fought Larry Holmes, and anybody I fought, Biggie, I mean, Tupac was at him. Mm -hmm. Anybody I fought, he was really at them. Tupac, that was really close friends with Mike Tyson, uh, in, in 1996, he dropped the, the Machiavelli album, and he name-dropped her name. He said, looking like Larry Holmes was flabby and sick. Uh, when you heard that, what'd you think? Then listen to it. And not only that, it, it doesn't matter what people say. They're going to say, if you're doing good, they're going to say it. If you're doing bad, they're going to say that. I don't care what they say about me because they're not putting a dime in my pocket, putting no, no food in my plate that's on, sits on the table. They don't do that. They go out there and do what they do. Like, I, I see these guys, man, these rappers and everything. I, 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 I hate to even comment on it because a lot of them is... <laughs> you know, they're shaking. But I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I'm happy. I got a beautiful wife. I got five kids, you know, <laughs> and, and I'm cool, man. What more you want? You know, like um, when I was in prison, um, his mother had wrote me a letter and stuff and asked me, you know, she said, my son said you let him in a club one time and, and he wants to see you. And my son is Tupac. I said, sure. And I knew who Tupac was, but I don't remember letting him in any club. Then he came and he discussed and made me remember it. Mm -hmm. And then we've been friends ever since. He came to visit me in prison twice. And he uh, he was really a, a special person. Mm. You know what I mean? I was just in, in this journey in life that I'm experiencing now. I'm just very grateful that I met him in this journey. Mm. It was really cool. It was a really cool yeah, guy. He's a very interesting guy, man. Very yes, interesting he guy. was. A guy that we know too well, Mitch Green. Mitch, oh, listen, I'm so happy for this guy. I heard he's a born-again Christian now. I heard he has a ministry. And if he does, that's so awesome. Mm. That is so awesome. Mm -hmm. Listen, I would have bet a million to one dollar that this guy would never go the route that he went now. And even if he was faking, faking, he wouldn't even go that route. Right. And that would have blew my mind. I would have lost my bet. Yeah, I knew Mitch Green, too, myself, for a long time. And where he's at right now in his life, you just want to forget about all the bad yeah, that he you did. Know God just truly like, is great. Yeah, yeah. It's just Ooh. try to the, put the guy up on the big thing. He's a minister. Can you yeah. imagine that? Miss Green with the Jerry. Do we still no, got the Jerry girl? He, he, he got a bald head now. Yeah, cut the Jerry yeah. Curl. That's true. That's true. Pitching him with a ball. Pitching him with a Jerry curl. Would be that would have been a good pass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Buster Douglas fight. Wow, that was pretty interesting. Bobby Brown said that. He was part responsible for you losing that fight. Well, he should have told me to go. He should have told me to go train him if he really cared <laughs> about me losing the fight and being right. responsible. Right. But you know, listen, um, Buster really trained hard, and I really underestimated him. And what happened happened. He fought a great fight, and he became champion. Mm -hmm. Mm. I'm trying to get him on my podcast. He, he don't want to go on my podcast. He didn't want to come on. Yeah, well, I asked for him. He never came down. So, so they said Bobby said that. He was he was he was with you in Japan, and uh, y'all had girls dancing. He was with you dancing well, on tour. Like dancing with the girls. No, he said y'all had girls dancing. What he said? Whoa. Mike Tyson and I were in Japan. We basically stayed up all night partying yeah. with twelve Japanese girls, 
And yes, yes. Bobby, Bobby's a good multiplier, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> He said, it was just me, Mike. I kept telling Mike, you need to go to sleep and get some lying. sleep. He's lying. Stop lying, Bob. <laughs> he said, you need to get oh, some yeah, sleep all right. for the fight tomorrow. Well, he can have all the girls, right? I get some sleep before he can have them all, huh? Right, right. He said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good setup. Yeah, go to bed and you keep all the girls, huh? He said. He said, then you told Bobby, listen, I'm not no amateur. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I did talk that flick shit. Right. Yeah, Nobody could beat me. I got this. I go to bed whenever <laughs> I got to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and you told Bobby, he worried too much. You got oh, this. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy. Oh, Aaron Snowboard was the trainer. How did you feel... When you finally found out that Aaron Snow, well, he, he used a rubber glove and put... Well, you know, this guy didn't know what the hell he was doing, and he panicked, and he, and he never really been in the magnitude of, of a fight like that, and he panicked. Mm. Well, I didn't care about my eye, but I was complaining about that. He was knocked out for, he was knocked out for 14 seconds, mm. and they, they gave me a long count. Oh, I wasn't the long complaining, count. but it was the truth. The long count. Let's so... do it again and count. As soon as he hit the floor, it was 14 seconds when he got up. All right. So Buster, they said Buster, when they asked Buster, and Buster denied it. What you think with me? He... Well, look at it right now. You can look at it right now. Look at your phone and it's counting. Right. Okay. Buster also, so Buster, he also said that you had a long count. I had a long count? Yeah. He said that you had a long count. So you got hit with a, with a Tyson uppercut. You went down. And when you watch the fight, right, and I, I watched it again this morning. To me, it was very clear that you were not dazed. You could get up anytime. You waited until about the nine count to fully come up and say, okay, I'm ready. Right. But according to Tyson, and I remember I watched a clip from his Broadway show, he, he is convinced that you had 13 seconds on yeah. that mat. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Yeah, that he was convinced that, that you were given 13 seconds and technically he knocked you out. Right. And he still says that to this day. Right, but they don't say how many seconds he got. Right. That referee was scared to death, like, oh my gosh, 1,100, <laughs> 2,202. His count was longer than mine. He's talking that smack. Right. Okay. That might so, be a discussion, because we're supposed to do a podcast together. Oh, you, you and Mike? Yeah. Okay, that's gonna be an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't make it then. He said, yeah. He it must have been to... that long. Did they count the 15? Yeah. Or well, whatever. Now, I mean. He never fought me back. He never fought you again. He'd have made more money fighting me than he fought Vander, but he never fought me back. I mean, why you think he never he, he never fought you again? He only asked him. That's why I wouldn't put him on the show. Well, they man. said allegedly that he said that. He had problems with Don King. Don King had a big lawsuit with him, and Don sued him, and that's why the fight never, we never turned back and happened again. But then again, you have to look at this situation. When you go through all that stuff that you just said, right? Mm -hmm. All that stuff that you just said. I keep talking. Go ahead, and I'll, I'll come back to that. You come back to it. Prison. Yeah, prison was pretty interesting for me. What was it like your first night when you got to your cell and you locked in? I don't know, I went and I got a soup and put it in and got some hot water in my soup and I went in the room and I ate my soup. It's, um, I've been in institutions most of my ju um, juvenile life. I used, I used to know that, so I know, um, I used to know poverty, crime, I know prison, I used to know that life. That's just, I don't care how much money I have, I've had trillions of dollars, I used to know that life. That life is just, it's just a part of my barometer. You know, it's just who you are. It's part of what makes me. It's my makeup. So it's just like me being in that juvenile home again. Mm. Same thing. Respect to it because respect yourself is the same, the same rules. Mm. Same rules. What was one of the worst experiences you had in jail? No, no bad experiences. No bad experiences. No beautiful experiences. I felt very safe there. Mm. Very mm. safe. Mm. You know, at one time I was, you know, being a brat and I got put in a whole fight with the guard, the guards and stuff. Mm. Ridiculous. Mm. So they became my best friends eventually. Mm.
Some of the guys was cool with you. Everybody was Yeah, cool. I was just mad for, for being in there. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that and this and that. I could have been in prison for some worse stuff a longer time, and I get in trouble for this stuff. And I was I never wasn't taking it well. So I got in trouble like the first six months and stuff, mm -hmm. cursing, getting written up. And then by that time, I got the hang of the place. Hey, I know how to do this. Who? Oh, hey, next thing you know, I'm dating one of the um, the council workers now. She's letting me have sex with her now. So I'm going good. Mm. But for the first six months, I was getting right up. I have to pay that year back. Now I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm like a star pupil prisoner, trusty, everything. Then it's, hey, Mike, remember the first six months you had pricked? Boom. Uh -huh. They gave me another year. <laughs> they said, Mike, I know you could work it up to see how far you can. <laughs> so, so they made you work like crazy. <laughs> the guy gave me a year. He was so happy and said, hey, man, I know you can work it off, man. You come so far. It's boom. They gave me another year. Can you imagine that? Mm, mm. So I had to, um, so if I passed this GED, they would have took that year away. So I, I, I flunked the fucking GED, right? And so I flunked the GED and got mad. And so I had to start dating this um, counselor and stuff, giving her money and, and doing really um, some nasty stuff to her. <laughs> and um, she let me pass this test, but they took my time off so I could go home in just three years oh. instead of doing four. Right, right. So this is serious. Like, time you look, cut. Time yeah, we're cut. laughing now, but I had four years. I had another year when he gave me that. And I was really, um, I was really um, socialized in the prison system by then. Everybody mm -hmm. knew me. I'm trusted. I don't need nobody to walk with me. And then they say, hey, you got another year. Mm. And what do you imagine me? How do you think I felt, I felt about that? I just blew my mind. I didn't know how this prison system worked. They could just write up, and then after you got too many write, write ups after three months, it just doesn't happen. The boy, hey, they give you this. Mm. After you establish, everybody's your friend. You like all the guards. They like you. Right, right, right. And um, they give you, hey, that's the other year. I know you can, yeah. I know you could get up. You came a long way for six months. <laughs> I know you can get rid of it. You can be that. What a year! I got four years in prison. I, I gave it with three. No, I gave it with fifty something. That first, they cut it all the way down mm -hmm. to three years. I was doing sixty nine at first. They gave me sixty three. No, sixty three. Then they took ten off. Then it was fifty three. And then they gave me 10, and I had to do three, and I got seven on parole, I guess, yeah. Mm. Mm. Did you experience any situation with, uh, with the COs, with the, the guards and no, stuff? At first, listen, at first Because they I, say you were very much a ladies' manager. Yeah, at, no, at first I was a prick and stuff, but then um, I realized these are the guys that's gonna allow things to happen, so I became very friendly with everybody. And yeah, I, I had a few lady friends in prison, and I was just very, um, and I'm not no cool guy, no Mac, no pimp, no fly guy. I'm just very grateful that, you know, things worked out for me. Because I didn't hurt that girl. I didn't do nothing to that girl to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I never got any trouble. I could have been in a lot of trouble, and I didn't expand my, expand my three years. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from that. And it wasn't a bad experience for me. They said that one time um, that you got caught with one of the CEOs, Guards and the, the warden found out, and they shut down all privileges and shut shut down everything moving. Well, listen, I never got caught with nobody. That was just um, people saying stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I go in there, because as soon as you come, you come to the door. The hallway's outside. You come in the door, you close the door, and my chair is right here by the by the wall, so you don't see me. You only see that window when you look in there. And they said we don't like the fact that you keep that door closed with the hem in there by yourself. And um, that was just other inmates that were jealous. What was your first day out of prison like? When you got out your scary, first day? Scary, really scary. Mm. I knew I wasn't safe. I don't care if I had a thousand bodyguards, you're just not safe out here. You know, you don't know when one of these guys, which one of these guys is gonna flip on me? What's gonna happen? Who are these guys? I never met these guys. It's just, you know. So you felt vulnerable? Just... Yeah, I stayed in my prison world. You know, I stayed with people in prison I met. And um, tried to get it together. I didn't get it together so well because I've been to jail like three more times after that. Mm. I was locked up three more times after that. Michael Jai White played you in the film. What did you think about his character? I don't know. I, well, he, he he did a good job. I think the film was garbage. Mm. You know, he did some things that I thought I, that uh, I could assimilate that being me. But yeah, um, I think the movie was really bad.
Mm. Bad movie. Okay. Bad timing. Tupac, how close were you guys? We were really good friends. We were really good friends. Um, I didn't hang out with him much. He didn't hang out, but we were always welcome when we saw each other. He was always welcome to be with me. He always had me welcome to be with him. And um, we were just really good friends. I had got him to a move, uh, a club one night. Um, I think it was one of Magic Johnson's parties that when Magic and them left and everything, he wanted to come in and we got him in. And he got on the mic and started rocking on the mic. And he was with Digital Underground. He wasn't known yet. They said his name is Tupac. He's gonna be a big star one day. Then his mother wrote me from prison and explained that Tupac was at the Indiana Black Expo and wanted to meet me. And that's the first day I met him. There's a rumor that you told Pac not to hang out with Hayes and Jack, but he didn't listen. Well, I used to told Pac, but I say, I don't know if you, I think you're out of your league right now. You know? Mm -hmm. Because he had asked me about Jack. You know, and I had known Jack through Scooter. And I used to say, you're out of your league, you know? You hang with the big boys now. Yeah, he's like, you're out of your league. Mm. Pac went to prison for the same similar situations as yours. Well, it's really easy to be a guy, you know, a young guy like um, myself at that time in Pac. We're in our sexual prime. Well, I mean, we, what we do, I'm a fighter. When you see me, I have my shorts on, a mask, and you see Tupac, he had a short. So it's easy to say that these big over-sexualized bucks would do something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Look, if you, if, you, um, if, you, if you have that belief in and that's when you understand all your life. That's if he's big and he, if he's big and he's black, he's a rapist. If he's a, if he's if he's smart, he's a tax cheat. And that's just how people um, pretty pretty much categorize people, categorize. stereotype people. Right, right. Put you in the same. Yeah. We're yeah. oversexualized. I'm an oversexualized buck. You see, like, you know, you look at me now, what, I'm 54, something like that? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm past my sexual prime. I don't have no trouble now, do I? <laughs> do I get in trouble anymore? You don't see nobody write anything about me no more, right, do you? Right, right. Things have changed. But when mm -hmm. I'm young out there and I'm strapped and I'm ready to go, I'm a menace. They'll watch my every move. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the real. That's, that's interesting. You think about when you, all these guys died around 25. They, they died in their prime, 22, 24, 25. Parking all those guys. Mm. There's too much testosterone for these people to handle. He was young, yeah. yeah. Young killers, yeah. Did you get to speak to him before the fight? Yeah, I was speaking to him because I always wanted he, he was doing my, my songs or my songs. So I'm saying, yo, Pocket, that's close to the fight, man. I think I need the song. The song's always late sometimes. Mm. He, was, he was cramming them. Mm. And so um, he went to, he, got, he always got him in like one, one hook. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's one take. You always one take, him, right? Yeah. And he always brought him on time. He was always late. Mm. He was the best, though. I really miss that guy. Imagine now he would be such an um, entrepreneur now. You know, it would see that he would be. That he would be such an independent entrepreneur now. He had the right people. Yeah. He would have been an awesome entrepreneur. He was on his way. He was on his way, man. He was doing phenomenal. He had the world at his fingertips. He know? really did. 100%. Keep I used it. to call his house three way and we used to talk in prison too. When we oh, yeah? In prison, yeah. Me, him, Rick James. And Rick James. Oh, wow. Yeah, what that was like. <laughs> now, what, now, what, now, what that was like. Rick James and Pac on the phone with Mike. Now, now that's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which I was talking about? Prison. <laughs> right. I ain't talking about nothing outside. Because everybody been in prison. Yeah. Now, listen, I would call my friend Kevin So I would call anybody. And we, I knew the time to call him. I said, well, if it's 8 o'clock here in Indiana, that means um, it's um, 6 o'clock there in California. And I knew they were out all night before them. So I know around this time they're back home and they had some girls over there. So when they, they when they're popping, they got to, I'm listening to the phone. I'm having people put this to say, hey, you got to pay me some cookies for this. <laughs> and then they hit the girl on the phone. <laughs> Oh my god, that, that um, must my, have been phenomenal oh, right there. Yeah, they would give me cookies, they give me some cookies, they give me some cookies. Right, talk to Rick James and Pop. That's crazy. How did you feel when you heard the bad news about Tupac? I felt that was really something I couldn't even exp I just knew that um, it was really a bad day when that happened. I just knew it was really bad. And um, I felt a little guilty about him coming to the five meets. Pressuring him for the day, hey, you bring the tape, don't forget the tape, you know? 
And I was going to go out with him that night. I promised to go to 662 with him that night. But I just had a little baby, and her mother was um, provoking me to stay home. So I stayed with the baby, and then someone called me that night and told me that happened. And I'm just, and um, this is just what we do. You know, I, I come to my senses, I come to the, my objectivity, and I, I know who I am, I know what my element's about. In my world, this is what happens in my world. This is what happens in my world. That was part of my world, my world, this happens. Mm. But just because it was Tupac and I was attached to it, it was different. But normally this is what I would expect somebody to die after a fight, or somebody get hurt, something crazy happened. But when it happened to him, it was, it was different. Tell me one of your greatest Tupac stories. Hey. I don't even know if I can say this one, though. <laughs> All right. It's in, I'm living in Cleveland then, but I'm coming out from L.A. I'm just coming from L.A. or New York. I'm coming, maybe New York. I'm coming, just go to the plane, Tupac's in the, in the arena. I'm in the arena in Cleveland. I'm dancing, I'm on stage with him, and then I'm watching the girls dance, and I say, hey, who's that? <laughs> He said, don't worry about that. I said, he said, he said you got to, don't worry about that, man. It's, it's poke on stage, man. Jump to stage. I said, no, who's that? And they, um, and the show was over. He said, go to the bathroom. Then she was said, go ahead, that's yours. Mm. That's one story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yours. I said, thank you very much, brother. Thank you very much. I said, thank you very much. Said, I don't do this to nobody else. This is you. I don't be doing this shit for anybody. This is you, my brother. I said, thank you so much. I love being your brother. Thank you, I'm your brother. Oh, God, thank you so much. He came bearing gifts. <laughs> Listen, um, I don't know if this is about my sex issues and stuff with girls, but listen, you're such a good friend to me because my friend at, oh, I was depressed one day. I guess that's when I was, um, I don't know why after my Lennox fight, I wasn't feeling so good lately. And my friend, you wouldn't believe how he just, I don't know how people do it. They get to Mike, you all right? You sure? I said, I'm looking at the wow, that's a nice looking girl. Hey, yeah, Mike, you like, you, you, you want her, Mike? And I just don't know how they do it. They just, get, they just come right over there. <laughs> <laughs> why did you say that? <laughs> and, um, I used, to, I used to admire guys like that. Like, right. like, hey, mate, you know, you like them, let's go over there. Right. I, I, that, you, one, two, three. What did you say? I used to know, what, <laughs> don't worry about that, Mike. It's, Tell me the cool. formula. Yeah. Like. <laughs> I'm not like that. I can't just get somebody to talk. To, I can't get no one to say hi to somebody. Let alone just meet them and go home with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After hearing the whole story about Tupac and then hearing Keefe D, his part about what he said, how did you feel? And I thought Keefe D was telling the truth. You know, I felt that he had nothing to lie about. Mm -hmm. You know, he hadn't, he's the, you know I mean, he's, he's the, he's the, he's the big player. He has nothing to lie about. You know, uh, we coming up, uh, what's the name? What's that, Flamingo? Yeah, I think that's Flamingo. We was coming up Flamingo and uh, got to the light. We was gonna go uh, drink and smoke some weed. And he happened to be hanging out the window. He was hanging out the window like he was in a parade. Tupac. Yeah, he was. Just bad day. Bad day. It's a bad, bad night, day. huh? It's a bad night. You never, we never know when we're gonna have ours. You know, we don't never know what God has creeping around the corner for us. If I'm always happy, you know, like see Zab or see people I know, we're still here. Mm -hmm. Every day you wake up. Since I wake up the next day, I know my friend I knew for 20 years died of an overdose. Mm -hmm. You think Crazy. they got it all together? Then they got a lot of money. They're going to be rich for the day they die, and they die. <laughs> you know, they mm -hmm. die rich, but they die young. That ain't cool. With kids, they, not the babies, little babies, and no one take care of the babies. Mm. In 96, the first Holyfield fight. Yeah. Do you think the headbutts was intentional? Kind of, yeah. He know he intentionally headbutted me because I was intentionally headbutting him. Right. You know what I mean? He could have said, yeah, I was headbutting Mike because Mike was headbutting me, but he never said that. He said he was just blocking his head. Mm, mm. So the second Holyfield fight, mm -hmm. more headbutting. Do you, you think after after you went through the whole thing, you don't want him? You told him about stop headbutting me. Now the second fight happened, and he started again. What you? What you I think? don't know. I, used, I shouldn't have got too mad. I was winning. I should have just cooled down and went through that fight. Why did you bite his ear the first time? I was just mad and pissed off, and was bleeding. I thought they would probably stop the fight because of my eye. And I just lost it. Was it true that they said that 
you bit half a, a piece of his ear off. I mean, that well, I did bite some. Piece I did buy some did because I spit it out. You know, when you go to movies, see, I go, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really true. Okay, good, good, good. So, Champ, there was rumors that you shaved your teeth for the Holyfield fight. Why? I don't know. They said that never. Allegedly, they said that you you shaved your teeth. So what what that do now? They shave. I unshave the teeth. Don't grow back. <laughs> That's very true. That's what very true. My teeth? Teeth don't See, silly guys, right. stop it. <laughs> These are the questions they're sending in. Okay. Um, your retaliation for the head button. That was... What, me biting him? Yes. Well, I just wanted to hurt him more than he hurt me because I was head butting him too. And I guess I wasn't hurting him enough because he was head butting me back. So I put the bite in the game. I wish I didn't do that, but I did. Your first heavyweight fight in over 50 years ended in disqualification. What did that feel like? The, that was the holy feel. I, I don't right? know. I don't know what it felt like. It didn't feel like much to me. Okay. In 98, you These sued... guys don't have good um, history counts, so I'm not going to believe it until it was 55 years since 1935. These guys don't know history that well. Right. I think somebody got disqualified in the 80s or something. Before that, right? That's what they're saying. That it was over fifty years. That's, no that's something they put together. Okay. In 1998, you sued Don King for a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars of stolen money. Did yeah. you receive the money in the lawsuit? Not really, but I received a little bit of money, twenty-four million bucks and stuff. Mm. The whole deal. The media put a number out there about how much money Don King took from you. In your words. How much money did Don King take from you? I, I don't know. I, listen, I had too much fucking. It was just coming in, dude. Money. I just had a lot of it. Before I signed with Don King, I remember talking to you, and you told me, you know, watch that brother. You know, watch Don. I said, Mike, you know, I might get ready to do a deal with Don, and you was like, you know, watch him, brother. You know what I'm saying? Like he's 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 not good. You know, you you kind of warn me, like don't. Yeah, but you, you gotta be careful for guys like that. Yeah. You gotta be careful. You can't blame him, it's just who he is. It was a thing out there that said that Don King settled with you for $14 million? No way. It was, he, didn't sell, he sold me, it was like $24 million or $25 at the most. $25 the most? Small amount. Mm. Mm. And you didn't get all the money, okay. Right now, what's your relationship with Don King? Do you ever speak to him? Well, I, well he called me on my birthday, I think. And um, I talked to him twice. Okay. That was nice of him. I don't hold no grudges no more. That was killing yeah. me. I don't yeah. hold no grudges. Life goes on. In 99, you went back to prison and was given a $5,000 fine, something like that? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they, was, they said they gave you some, pro, some, some probation. You had a motorless, uh, a motorcycle accident. No. A motorcycle it's, accident. Fab, listen to this. I was off my Medicaid. I was in my car and somebody rammed me from the back. Mm. So, because somebody rammed him. So I got in my car, this guy got rammed me because the guy hit him, bow, out he go. So I go to the next guy that rammed him, I said, no, why you hit me, you dumb motherfucker? Boom, kicks him in the balls. And so I take off, I leave, the cops get me, they put me on my ground, I'm, 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 I'm saying words that are not nice. And um, they let me go, I go to court and I go to jail. What was it like going back your second time? Oh, it was like being in a box. I stayed in that one cell for 24 hours. So for the whole four months you stayed in that one cell? That one cell. Don't leave yourself nowhere. So that was torture. Yeah. Mind boggling. Yeah. In 2000, you knocked out Lou Salvarese in 38 seconds. You were there, right? Yeah, I was there. We were on the same. I was your co main event. We had a lot of fun over there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know what's happening back then. I don't know. I was, I was, I was manic back then. Yeah? But yeah, really. Cadalla died and yeah. I was trying to change remember, my life. I remember we was over there and so like, over there they don't have a lot of nice cars. So I guess they had like the only nice, the only nice Mercedes car they got, they gave us. And then we was at the gym one day and they brought us kilts. And you was like, <laughs> we was trying on kilts and you got on top of the, on top of the Mercedes, started jumping up and down and smashing the whole roof in. Oh God! I didn't mean and to the do guy, that. the guy was the, the guy was looking at you like, 
Oh my God, that's the only car we got like that over here. Oh, There's no more God. those over here. <laughs> uh. He was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Then he went on the inside. He was trying to push the thing. I was, like, I was looking like, no. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> but they brought us out some kilts. I mean, I, I learned something very good about the Irish people. They brought us the kilts out. And they told us the history behind the kilts and stuff like that. I remember what I was like, well, not you, but I was like, man, those are kilts, those are skirts, those are girls. And the guy looked at me, he really wanted to fight. He was like, what? It's yeah, not a skirt. Fighters, it's like, it's not a skirt. This is the man's wear this. I'm like, all right, the tell me about it. Count. Yeah, yeah. So that was very interesting too. After you did a very uh famous speech that everyone knows about right now about Alexander the Great. He's oh, known Michelangelo. Your jab is ferocious. I know that your jab is impeccable. <laughs> hey, listen, listen. I was smoking a little bit too much back then, you know, and shit just happened, you know. It's, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just... In 2000, you fired your whole crew, got a whole new team, your accountants, lawyers, everybody. Well, they, they weren't no good anymore. I, I didn't have anything. that proved that they're no good, right? right? So I had to get a new team. Right, right, right. Talk about some of the debt you had back then. Uh, 2000, um, I must have been, what, 60 million in debt by then, huh? When I say, I was, I was, listen, I had so much debt that I couldn't pay the people, right? I couldn't believe how I kept my house and I got all this debt. Next thing I know, you can't pay three or four years away, they take this off. You can't pay, no, they take this off. And then it was getting down to like 25 in the world. And they, and they call you, Mike, can you give us anything? You must have something. I know you're gonna fight again. And but we we hustled to get that um, to get that monkey off our back, and we've been um, tax tax free for three years. Nice, nice. No tax problems. In two thousand three, you beat up Don King. Mm. You know, I was I was pretty immature in two thousand and three. I was really upset, and I, I've done things I shouldn't have done. I really loved Don, and I really didn't mean to do that stuff back then. Allegedly, you said that you left him in a bloody pope. I don't know. I don't yeah, talk. you was high. It, it, it says that uh, y'all was on his private jet or something like that. Y'all was Whoa. On the... Yeah, that was pretty serious. <laughs> um, we were on the jet. I, was, I told this story before. I was on the jet. I had Jackie and I had my girlfriend with us. And um, Don was talking to me and he was talking about Man, I like, gotta get these white motherfuckers out of our business, man. That's all these white motherfuckers do. Just come over here, me, you gonna sign this check, nigga, and me, you gonna be two rich niggas, okay? And so he had me on that, but as soon as I get on the phone, I, I'm going back, I'm gonna make another deal with Dawn, I'm gonna have millions again, and everything's gonna be all right. But on the plane, I start doing some cocaine. And I'm getting ready to go see 40 million bucks, and I'm broke, I don't have a penny. So I'm on this jet, this beautiful jet. And I do the cocaine. And once I do the cocaine and then it, um, it percolates, start percolating, I say to myself, Don is dissing me. He said, this is my motherfucking plane. He said, my plane with the money he stole from me to pick me up. That's some bitch shit. And I don't know why I said that. I don't know why my man, why did my mind, why did I go there? Why can't I go somewhere else? Why did I have to go there? Why did it have to be about me? So they made this all about me. This airplane is my plane, and he's making a fool out of me by sending my plane to pick me up, and I can't keep my plane. And um, I have all this festering up by the time I get landed in Miami. And so we land in Miami. Dawn comes, and um, I get in the back. Jackie gets in the front, and the girl I'm with, she gets in the back with me. And then Don started talking, hey man, yeah man, we gonna get this money, fuck these white motherfuckers, man, gonna be me and you two niggas. And for some reason, I just, I don't know, I just, I'm in the back of the road with and I just kick the boom, and it stops, it's on the 15, you know, with the highway. 15, yeah, yeah, 15 in Miami. South. Miami, yeah, and um, I, oh, it was just bad, right? It, was, it just was bad, it was bad. So some kind of way, we chasing around the car, He and then he gets in the car, he takes off. He takes over on Jack. the highway? Yeah, he takes over Jackie and my people in the car. And I'm on the highway, the car to come, and I'm on the fucking highway. <laughs> and so my girl gets out the car with Jackie. They walk back down the highway, right? And then my girl got weed and cocaine in my box, you know, my shoe box, and some weed and cocaine in there. And we're walking the highway. <laughs> and um, I know it's hot. 
It's high. It's nighttime though. But this cop just picks us up. We get in his car. He drives us to the hotel and just lets us out. He doesn't say hi or nothing. We got the drugs and the cocaine and smell the whole car. He just picks us up, let us off. Doesn't say a word. Don't say a word. Not a word. The creepiest shit I ever found. The buy officer just takes off. Don't say a word. I don't think I got. I, oh man, if you ever see Jackie, we'll ask for that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, can you imagine me, Jackie, and my friend? We walking on the highway. On the highway. Can you 95. imagine? You know, I'm on drugs. Right? I'm oh, on the man. highway. <laughs> wow. No, oh no. man, I, I think you walking on the highway now when I'm driving. I think they're nuts, and that's what I would do. <laughs> walking on <laughs> with drugs. So the cool thing about Don that I appreciate about him, he doesn't press charges. He's Never not like a, ever. He's not like a run to the cops guy. You know what I'm saying? That's a Woo, that's one thing, man. That's one thing I respect about him. He's not going to the cops on you because man, I know some guys that have some promoters that have some incidents with next and they hit they throwing everything. Oh, yeah, they... ICO, FBI, everything. <laughs> I mean, CPO. Oh. If they got a letter, they're going for it. <laughs> yeah, Don is a pretty stand-up guy. I must say that about him. He, he take a lick and keep on ticking. You all patched up. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Don. We love you, Don. Yeah. <laughs> 2003, you filed for bankruptcy. Tell me about that. Hey, I don't know nothing about that bankruptcy. Once they say you don't have no more money, I have to send this over, I leave. Right. Other than that, it didn't feel like a bankruptcy. I had my house. I was, I don't know. It just, it just worked out. Right, you was still I, don't, I had my wife within my corner. I had just married. I wasn't even married to her at the time. She just... Rushed in my life, she saw I was just um, a zombie on all the medication, opiates, and she just got involved in my life. Fired my old um, um, accountant, got a new guy. And we had started, she started writing plays. We did plays. We got um, known for plays. We did world trips, tours on the plays. And then we got, in, we got into entertainment business. We got into the marijuana business. I believe we we have some marijuana banks now, (laughs) weed banks. Um, And and it's been very successful. And I just decided I wanted to do something. I was a little, I don't know what was boy. I just decided I want to, I think I can still fight. You know, I got got desire. Like when I didn't want to fight last time I fought, and the the year that I was fighting, when I was fighting a lot, I didn't even want to fight then. Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling good. I didn't have the money I believe I had. And so I lost the desire. And so I just started working out, getting in shape, sparring a little, and the, desire, and the desire came back. And I want to do something. I want to try it again. I want to test myself. I'm the kind of guy that just want to test myself. Just keep testing myself. But I must say, me being me being in here in the camp with you, I'm very impressed. I'm, you know, I'm saying like like I'm I'm, I'm motivated <laughs> to even start working out myself because I'm watching how dedicated you are every day. You're getting up, and I'm watching how you're getting in here and moving your body and moving your head and, and boxing with these young boys. And it's very impressive. I ain't gonna lie. No. I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna be better and throw more punches. I have no. three more weeks to go and I'm gonna improve on these three weeks. I'm just looking forward to it. Right, right, right. You're looking good though. Mike, you've known to have a very exquisite lifestyle. They say one time you lost a $7 million chain. What's up with that? Stuff happens, man. It's just left in the... Somewhere. Death happens. Can't take it with me when I die. Right. Right. Oh yeah, that's what it was. You told Jim Jones about that, that you lost your diamond necklace. Yeah, I lost all my jewelry. So you know, when you're young and you're getting high and fucking with these broads, they had to clip you. Mm. You gotta be mm. careful. Mm. 100%. In 2005, you fought Kevin McBride. Oh, you? that was really disgusting. That was, <laughs> what was, that, that what was you, the last hurrah. That was the last hurrah. What you was going through at that time? Bankruptcy and all that bullshit. And I just wanted to get this fight over to pay banks and pay bills and stuff. But I didn't really want to fight. I, I didn't have a tenth of the desire I had now. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I didn't have no desire prior to get in shape and look good, I was fat in that fight. See, I'm looking beautiful in this fight. I was fight with you there, I too. To I was with you there with the Kevin McBride fight, and you didn't, you nowhere near was motivated as you are now. Oh, well, this is what it's about now. Yeah, yeah, 100%. After losing a fight, you said you would quit. You yeah. Never, you would never come back in the ring again and do none of this. Well, that was just that was just macho stuff. You know, you never know what's gonna happen. You lost. You're in a you're in a, you're in a, you're in a bad end of a fight, so you really figured nothing good's gonna happen after this. So you say you want to quit, and I did. I really didn't want to fight. 
I went I went to I went to the old mic back to women and girls and drugs and liquor and stuff. And I was in there and I got married and that was going crazy. Then it started going great and I've been married for 11 years now. In 2007, Mike, you pleaded guilty to a DWI. I can't remember which one. It must have been a couple. Was it in Phoenix, Arizona? Where was it at? It's, no, no, this one was about the wizard. Yes, um, I, I, was, I was arrested for a DWI and um, I was really... I was really, I wasn't on alcohol. I was on cocaine. They made it a, a DWI, and um, I didn't stop smoking. I couldn't stop. I was addicted to weed. I couldn't stop smoking, so I had to get a wizard, wizardator, a fake dick with somebody else's piss in, a clean piss that was warm. And I used to always do this. I used to say, "Oh, come on, man, you ready to put?" Just like act like I was gonna pull out from here. You know, turn around. You gotta say, "Turn around." I was pulling out the click. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and I was like, oh, you want to see some dick, nigga? I always say that to the guy. He, I'll give him that gay comment. Oh, you want to see some nigga dick, huh? That's what you want to see. Hey, right. get away. Turn around. I let the stuff out. Uh -huh. And I get away with it. The piss will be clean. I just say, I hope the guy don't say, Mr. Tyson, you're pregnant. Right. <laughs> 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 oh, so it's an actual penis that looks like a penis? It's a fake penis. I, I, I try to paint, I paint it with a little tan color, color my thing. And I pull it out of you, man, you want to see some nigga dick? Mm -mm. And the guy, hey, I don't want that. And then I turn around. And I, <laughs> I, was sick. I was sick. I'm sorry. I just... At this point in your life, champ, do you think you beat your drug addiction? Hey, listen, man. I'm never in my life am I going to, am I going to sleep on um, drug addiction. I don't sleep on drug addiction. I know guys going 20 years without drugs, and the next thing you know, they died of an overdose. Mm -hmm. So I never, this thing's strong. While I'm, while I'm straight and I'm getting stronger, it's doing push-ups right now, getting stronger next time it attacks me. Mm. You know, I know the power of drugs. I know the power of mind, too. Can never under, nothing, nothing in this planet or this world to be meant to be underestimated. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a drug addict for the rest of my life. I just won't be using but I'm always be a junkie for the rest of my life. Yeah, that's how it works. You don't have that power. I don't have the power to say I'm not going to be a junkie next year. You know, I just don't have the power. I have the power not to be a junkie this moment. Right. You know? This moment is my future. This moment is my past, and my future is everlasting. In 2011, you was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that was. Um, what did that feel like? That was my clown, my crowning achievement. Mm -hmm. That's why we do this stuff. We want money and stuff now, but we want to go in that place where other people would never go. You know, the Hall of Fame. Box Hall of Fame. Last forever. It that never ends. Mm. It One day. It ends when this planet ends. It was a quote that you said, the more I look into churches and mosques, I see the devil. What well, did I, I didn't say that? it in that way. I said to the to the the more I'm in the house of the more I'm in the house of God, the more I see the devil. Mm. And I said that in um in a way like you see people in there it's the fans, yes, it's, it's a lot of wealth. It's a lot of, and I don't think that's what it's about. And that's just my opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody's looking good, everybody. We're doing this for God, you know? But I don't know, I'm no one to judge. I'm just, I'm just no one to judge about that. But um, right. I, I think, um, I don't know, religion is interesting. We have, we have religion because we don't know, but we really don't know the truth about anything. Mm -hmm. Tell me where we came from. Can, can the religion tell us where we came from? Can religion tell how do we exist? Can religion say what's make me say what I'm saying right now? No one knows anything, so we have to say this is what God do. God, our mind is not can't perceive of God, can't perceive of the power of God. You know what I mean? He, God made us for that particular reason, for him, for we not to get too familiar with Him. You know, but there's still people that feel they know Him better than we do. Mm. I, just, I just respect all religions. I respect any belief anybody believes in. Mm. Mm. God is real. There was a saying that you uh, converted to Islam in prison? Hell no. I've been a Muslim before I went in prison. Right. Just because I was in the mosque when I was in prison, 
they think I was converting. I'm so just... that was the first time they actually seen you probably doing it. So you were before that. Okay. Now, are you, are you still practicing muscles? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Champ, it was once said that you was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I might be tripolar. I'm everything, man. I'm, yeah, listen, I am, I am something special. Yeah, I'm interesting. <laughs> I'm an interesting guy. So you recently had a big interview right now where it's going ballistic with the Boosie, with Little yeah. Boosie. And his situation with his, with his gay situation, he told him that he might be homophobic and, or he might be a homo. Well, listen, some of my best friends are gay. I just don't know it yet, you know? <laughs> and um, that's just who we are as human beings. I'm not saying Bootsy was gay. I just said, did you have any, um, any kind of empathy about that or feel that way? Because you, he had came out very disrespectful about um, damn Dwayne, Dwayne Wayne's son. And my daughter lived that life. Mm -hmm. And she came from New York to, to this, to right here in this office right here to confront this guy. Mm -hmm. And she's violent. And so I, I didn't know why. I thought she came to see me. Mm -hmm. I thought she was in the, came all the way down here to come and see her my father, yeah. her mother-in-law, you know, um, stepmother, Kiki. I thought she came to see her. She came to confront him physically. Mm -hmm. And so I had to, I had to, um, Oh man, I just had to take care of that before this hit. And I, I was watching her getting, she wants to physically grab this guy and start attacking this guy. Wow. And so I had to come in, I'm watching her. So I had her, she said, you know, you, she explained herself, then he explained stuff, and it didn't go as bad as I thought it was gonna go. They took a lot of stuff out the interview, but he, was, he seemed like he was passionate about it. And after that, me and his daughter went on interview. His daughter came and interviewed me. She like, Dad, I want to interview him. I want to I wanna, I wanna ask him some questions right now. I say, come on. Come on. You know, so she got in there. She, uh, she on something. I'm going to tell you what she on. Do you know how many people you are? Of, do you know what's going on? In, no, she was saying stuff like, do you know what's going on in the transgender world right now? And do you know how many people are committing suicide and dying. So I would tell her, do you know what's going on in, with black people right now? We're getting shot down. We're getting, they got so many single mothers out there. And when she would shoot that at me, I would shoot that at her. So basically she was saying the things that she was passionate about. And I was saying the things that I was passionate about and she couldn't feel me. And, and I guess she was saying I couldn't feel her, but I was telling her I have no ill wills towards that. But I was telling her, you're talking about that. Well, let me, I'm talking about this also. I feel like this is a bigger subject that's close to my heart. So we didn't see eye to eye, so she got up and walked out. Okay, was Tyson in the room when this was happening? Yeah. I learned that day that there's a set of people and they're very serious about stuff like that, calling somebody gay or queer or a fag or stuff. That they're very, those words are very offensive. Very offensive. They're very, it's very offensive to them. That's like calling black people niggas in their face. Mm -hmm. It's very, I didn't know. I took it for granted. I was a guy and I was a sexist and I didn't understand other people's feelings. From that experience, for to come from New York, he had to represent who she was and to get physical. I had to do nothing but respect that. And I, I used to talk totally different to her. Mm. You know? So so she's really, she, yeah, she's really, yeah, she's serious like that. This is a really serious fraternity. The case, what are they again? LGBT. Uh, ooh, they're very serious. Mm. They're very serious. I better get the name down too. Um. I get in trouble. Yeah, very serious. They say that you over the course of your career made $300 million. Really? That's what they said. That's what they said. Okay. Uh, and then at one point you, you filed for bankruptcy and you were, you were in debt. Uh, that's an amount of money that's just mind blowing. 300 million, that's like multi-generational wealth to, you know, to your great, great grandkids. Uh, when you look at that amount of money, number one, do you think that that was the right amount or do you think people are, are exaggerating on it? I don't think about how much money I had. You know, um, the word had is one of the worst 
in the words in the American language. Mm -hmm. I had this. I was this. I used to be this. It's all about now, the moment. Yeah. Uh, you you know, can ask me anything you want, but I'm just saying. You know, like during those days, for example, there was the, a story that Ed Lover told about the, the Rolls Royce. Can you talk about that story? Yeah, I had, I had cars, cars, money that mean nothing to me. Now, like you say, if I had 300 million, well, it's something around 300 million. What would 500,000 matter? Yeah. Mike goes to send his man in to pay. I'm outside. I'm like, yo, Mike, good time, man. It's getting late. What, yo, got to take me back to New York. Let me get the car out the garage. Mike's like, nah, I, I, I can't go back to New York. I got a lot of shit to do tomorrow, Ed. I got to go right to where I'm going. I'm like, well, Mike, have one of your mans or somebody take me in a different car just so I go get my car, man. I got to get my car. Nah, we, I need everybody with me. And he goes, don't your moms live around here somewhere? I'm like, yeah, she don't live too far from here. And he throws me the keys to the Bentley. I take the Bentley back to my mom's block in Queens. I park it on the street. I hit it. Boop, boop. I start walking in the house. Then I'm thinking, hold on. You can't leave this car outside on the street, bro. You got to put it in a garage, but we ain't had no garage. My pops tore it down, so I pulled it into the backyard. Long story short, week go by, I still got this car. Two weeks go by, I still got the car. Three weeks go by, my boys are gassing me out. You got to move this, man. You got you can't just let it sit there. The motor seize up. I don't know nothing about no Bentley. So I'm driving this shit around the hood like it's my car now. I, I had already <laughs> gone and got my car, but I left the Bentley at my mom's house. Because I, I, where I lived there in Jersey, you couldn't take it over there either at the time. So I'm rolling. I got this Bentley all of a sudden. My pager go off, 911, 911 with a number. See, that's pager days. I call back, go, yo, hey, Ed, this is John Horn. You know, Mike's. I said, yeah, John, I know who you are. Yo, by any chance, do you happen to have one of Mike's cars? I go, yeah, I got that Bentley where we was out the other night. Yeah, I got that. He said, well, give me an address. I'm going to send somebody to come get it. I didn't think none of it. I knew it wasn't my shit. So they came and got the car. Gone. Fast forward 15 years later, I'm in Vegas at Tau. I see Mike come in. He's standing by the bar. Of course, I got to go holler at him. That's my man. I'm talking to Mike. People come up by, hey, champ, how you doing, man? How you doing? Good. How you? Hey, Ed Lover, what's up, bro? Mike goes, Ed, it's been a good life, right? I'm like, yeah, Mike, it's crazy. He said, people still call me champ. Man, I ain't been in the ring in over 10 years. People still call me champ. Yeah, it's been a long time since you're on TV Rats. People still know you. They know everything. So, man, remember we used to go out to Nels and shit, have a good time and all that. I said, remember that spot we went to in Queens with the Jamaican bitches? I was like, yeah. So, remember that night I gave you the Bentley to take to your mom's house? I was like, yeah, I remember that. He said, you know, I gave you that car, right? I said, what? <laughs> he said, no, nah, I gave it to you. you. I wanted you to have that. You was my man, you know. And I know you couldn't afford a Bentley or nothing like that. So I like having all my friends, you know, be fly. I just not really want you to have that. He said, John and them came and got that. These jealous motherfuckers, right? I was like, yep. I said, you tell John Horn if I see him, nigga, you owe me 400000 <laughs> all right? Because this nigga gave me a Bentley and you came and got it. I didn't know it was mine. I, I said, why you ain't tell me? Like, yo, you know I was getting high, Ed. I remember I gave her a lot of cars out. I'm like, this nigga. Crazy. Gave me this shit. I used to have a lot of money back. I had more money than anybody in our community had. Even every entertainer, I had more money than none. Yeah. So um, it, I never had money before. So it, uh, that's what you do when you never had money. You buy, you buy a lot of goodies for you and your friends that never had money. You know, Jamel Hill, I interviewed her recently. Yeah. And uh, we talked about how so many athletes that come from poor neighborhoods, they end up making so much but then they end up losing a lot. And she feels it's because of survivor's remorse because they feel- Absolutely, some people feel that way. Yeah. I, I feel that way now, so how did this guy die? And I'm still alive and this is the smartest guy. This guy worked this way, everybody respect this guy. He was dangerous and this and that, and he's not here no more. Yeah, yeah. and you know they feel like they won the genetic lo you know, lottery in a way, because they were just born, you know, because. You can't train to be a Mike Tyson. You have to be born genetically a certain type of way and then train on top of it, right? Like everyone can't be a Mike Tyson. No, everybody can't. No one could be Mike Tyson. Everybody's gonna be who they're gonna be. Right. Whatever they're gonna do. But, but, but I mean, a, a certain level of athleticism is genetic. You have to be born strong. Why? You know, you, you could train, but you also have to have that. So a lot of them feel guilty because they were just born that way. And a lot of times with these great athletes, People know they're great in elementary school. You know, it doesn't come later. So everyone treats them a certain type of way. 
everybody's different. You look at this, Rocky Marciano and Larry Holmes. They're probably the only two heavyweights that probably started in their 20s or late, like 19 yeah. to 20. And they're two of the greatest heavyweights all lived, ever lived. They yeah. started late. Yeah, Larry Holmes. Two of the great, legendary. 48 and 0. Yeah. No, I'm talking about how, what, when he started, when he was 19 started very years late. old. Yeah. 21, something like that. I'm talking about that's boxing amateurs. When I, I just interviewed Larry Holmes recently, and he talked about the fight with you. Mm -hmm. um, well, number one, he told, talked about how he was retired at the time. Yeah. He didn't want it. He was in a, I know. a in a singing group. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> How was he? Joe Frazier sung better. <laughs> now, you know, Joe, I'm saying Joe Frazier had more energy than he did. <laughs> Joe Frazier, Joe rolling, rolling on the rears. He's moving. Larry Holmes did. Yeah, baby. Nah, that's not what we got to move, Larry. He's moving your ass. Well, the way he described that fight was that he was completely retired. And then Don King showed up at his house one day with half a million in cash. I say, take this money, Larry, it's yours. He's like, what the hell? I'm not going to fight Mike Tyson. Are you crazy? Like, he didn't want to take the fight. You ended up retiring. Uh, you were 37 years old. And you stayed retired until Don King shows up at your house one day. And what the hell that money come? <laughs> that money comes back. <laughs> Don't you know money make you talk? <laughs> money make you do crazy things. I didn't, you know... I had quit, retired, living, living in my nice house with my wife and with my kids. And Don King come with a big bucket of money and then what you gonna do? It's yours, Larry, it's yours. All is mine. Yes, that's yours. All you gotta do is sign here. Sign where, Don? <laughs> right there, okay. <laughs> sign. Money is the root of all evil, man. Okay, so Don King shows up at your house and he says, I want you to fight Mike Tyson. I, well, my and first impression was, shit, you got to be crazy. Me? Fight Mike Tyson? He said, yeah, you can fight Mike Tyson. You can beat Mike Tyson. I said, I know I can get around all this stuff that you don't, but I can't beat Mike Tyson because there's a lot of things he don't do. He said, you can beat him, Larry. I know you can beat him. He said, I'm going to give you this many weeks to get ready. It's going to be like nine weeks. I had to train. And I said, damn, Don, I don't know about that. He says, here you go. Slap it on there. Here's $500,000 on my hand. Right in the living room there. $5,000. I mean, 500000 What am I supposed to do? Don, what are you doing with all that money? Somebody's going to rob you, man, around here. Ah, 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 ah. Rob me? No, you're going to rob me, champ. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. But you better get this money. Larry said that once he finally accepted the, the fight with you, he didn't have much time to train, and then Don kept pushing it up also. I, I, listen, I, I believe him 100%. Yeah. That that's what people should do. But look, you saw how he got in shape and stuff. He fought Holyfield. Close yeah. fight, um, um, Tommy Bull, Oliver McCall. Yeah. You know, I just got him at the right time. He's a special fight. He's a guy that can fight for a long time. He has probably got mad and bitter about that lad. Imagine if he never stopped fighting. Yeah. He probably would have won, would won the title back. Oh, yeah. One of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Underestimated. Absolutely. 48 and 0. Underestimated. He said that uh, Rocky Marciano can hold his jock well, strap. He shouldn't have said that, but it was, <laughs> he's just amazing. Well, he said in the fight with you, uh, he said his arm got caught in the ropes. In the rope. And he said that had it not got caught, he might have been able to hit you with that Maybe uppercut. Maybe so, but it wasn't meant for that to happen. <laughs> it wasn't meant for that to get, catch that punch. The fight happened, and, you know, he ended up hitting you with some some tough shots. And he Man, he knocked, knocked the hell out of me. What are you talking about, some tough shots? Don't shot so hard. <laughs> He hit me, man, bang, bang, bang. You know, and the reason why he did that, and I'm going to show you something, because I set him up. I set him up for right in my trap with a right uppercut. I went back, run around the ring a little bit. He was pushing on, and I went back on the ropes. I said, I got him now. Come on in here. And when he come up, was ready to come in, and I threw shot, whop. And that didn't hit him good. That didn't hit him good. So he backed off and came in again. 
I did it again. Wow! I still didn't hit him right. Didn't hit him right. And here he comes again. I set him up because he's, he's dumb. He keeps coming with the same stuff. You know, he didn't know to leave it alone, go another way. But I was dumb too for falling in the corner and letting him get double shots at me. But and uh, I went to throw a punch, and my arm got caught. And with the rope, I throw uncle. I'm, I'm gonna get him with the, that. I'm determined to get him with this uppercut. So he, here he comes. I got him. I got him. I went like this. And then my, the rope caught my damn arm. And I was like this. And he hit me two, three more times. That was it. Um, I'm not sure if it was after the fight or before the fight. He had some words about you. He spoke He spoke badly about you. No, he, he said that he's going to go to prison after this. Yeah, yeah. My he, wife, listen, my wife want to see him and talk to him about him and laugh. Yeah, you told him he was going to go. So my wife is one of those wives that if, I, if you got a big ego, she can't wait to do something to crush your ego. Oh, she, you know what I mean? One of those wives. Yeah. You look at you, yeah, sure. What else do you want to look at besides yourself on television? It's one of those wives. Yeah. And, I'm, and she's just always waiting for me to get the ego crushed. You want to hear a story about Zip? So one day Dawn comes and tries this shit with me, put me around $600,000 and, and then a bag. And you know, believe it or not, $600,000 is heavy. I know you guys think if he told you guys grabbing bags like um, Tony Montana coming in there. They're not grabbing bags like that. You know what I mean? Like a... That might be that might be 12, 11 pounds. A million bucks is probably like 75 pounds. So mm. It's not something you can run around and run the block with, you know what I mean? So um it was um it was crazy when we had all that money, you know? And so well we were talking about Don, huh? Yeah. So um I don't know if I should even say this shit. But um no, fuck it. Go ahead. <laughs> Ask okay. another question. Fucking zip took zip took like six tip took the six hundred thousand dollars. Really? Yeah. From who? From Dom. And he came in with the money. He's trying to do something. And then zip to your thought, let's come, let's come back later and we'll talk yeah. about that. He's walked them out the door. He said, hey, man, let me get some of that money to pay some people. I got to pay some people. <laughs> WDC, the dog, the dog, come back. He's come back. And Zip, you never met Zip, have you? I haven't, no. Zip is such a gentleman. Dog, please come back. Zip. Not right now, now. He's just not feeling well, dog. Click, click, bye. <laughs> and then we're thinking about it. We're like, wow, we're going to have a party. Let's get some bitches. Let's get everything. We got to do it tonight. That's $700,000 right there. Mm -hmm. Well, Larry, we, were good. we were good for um, getting people to invest money in us, and we just say, hey, we're not doing it. Uh, T.K. Kirkland's a regular on my show. Oh. He was on your show recently. Yeah. And um, you got angry at him over one of the statements that he made. What was that? Well, you said that at the height of your success, you hated yourself. Yeah. And he said... That's not true. You didn't hate yourself. And then you said, how are you going to tell me how I feel? In the interview, Mike Tyson talked about how he had these millions of dollars. Yes. And yet he hated himself. And you said, come on, Mike, you didn't really hate yourself. Right. And what did Mike say? And Mike said, who the fuck are you <laughs> to tell me I ain't shit? <laughs> and I'm looking at him because I didn't know where he was going with that energy. And hearing different stories from around the world and people like, oh, Mike was about to jump in TK's ass and this and that. And I want people to know that me and Mike Tyson have been friends for over 40 years. We're good, good friends. And in that interview, I saw that my energy and the positive side that I have of myself to uplift other people Mike didn't give a fuck. So my thing to myself was allow him to go down that path and not try to encourage him that he's a better man. Just let it go. And 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 and, and I could see if people don't know him, mm -hmm. they could see how, whoa, this is about to jump off. Right. But Mike would never cross that line with me. At least I don't think so, but I'm 99% sure. Well, some people want to have an image of you. And they don't care what your perspective on you, even though it's your perspective and you're the person you're perspective on, they want to have their perspective on life. 
I know who I am. That's why some people can't reach the success that they want because they don't deep dig in and find out who they are and they're not happy with who they are. Yeah. That's why they don't reach the success that they want or happiness. Not just need money, but it's happiness, someone to love because they never get in touch with that part that they believe is bad. And they keep trying to hide it where it never goes. It's not because it's you. Where are you going to go? You can't hide from you. Yeah. You know, when you look at your overall success, is it kind of crazy how you think like you start out as a boxer and now you're making cartoons. Now you're doing Broadway shows. Now you got a podcast. You, you've, you've really taken your, your celebrity and flipped it into other things. Does, does that surprise you or is that, you know, you always felt you no, were doing? No, um, I just know I want to be up more than anybody wants me to be down. That's just all I know. I just think of myself accomplishing good things. I never think of myself doing creepy things. That creeps up sometimes and I get it out. I only think about myself doing things that I want to do. That's part of things I want to accomplish. A lot of times, you know, because you were so popular, not only in the ring, but some of the things you did out of the ring. So for example, when you would do your, your pre-fight uh, conferences and stuff like that, you, you would say some, some stuff that kind of shook people up. I remember there was this one guy, um, you did an interview with one guy where, I think he told him to go fuck himself. In the I've done that before. Well, you know, that's when you, at that, that stage in my life, I was dealing from a point of no, definitely no self-love. You know, I was going through so many different periods of my life during that time. During my, my professional boxing career, I was going through the worst. I was going through my growing period. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, it's almost like, um, it's almost like a young girl having a period for the first time. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Everything's just, everything's off limit. Yeah. You know, it's almost like you feel like you own everything. No one, no one to talk to, you don't want to feel nothing from nobody. And it's just really, I don't know, maybe it was a mental breakdown or something. I don't know. Well, I know like for example, Tupac, one of the things that he always felt based on conversations that I've, I've, I've talked to people is that all publicity is good publicity, even if it's negative. So he felt like getting a bunch of negative publicity helped him. And when I was watching you, I, I felt like, okay, Mike is manipulating the media. He, he's saying stuff just to get- I've never manipulated the media. I just always proved at certain times that I'm smarter than they are. I'm smarter than they believe that I am. Yeah. Excluding yourself, your top five fighters of all time. Too many. Can't do that. Yeah. Uh, Mount, Mount Rushmore, it. top four guys. Can't do that. You know, you want them up there, but you put those four guys up there. You put those four guys on Mount Rushmore, right? Yeah. Put them up and go like this, and now name some great for you. You say, oh, that motherfucker should be up there. Oh, fuck. <laughs> right? You got to leave me fighting without saying who's the best. You can't say, you see, well, this guy does this, this guy. Whoa. He's just. Different yeah, different era, yeah. different style. You know, uh, after, after the. Uh, the Buster Douglas fight. Yeah. He fought uh, Holyfield. Yeah. And uh, that fight didn't go too well for Buster. When when you saw that fight, how did you feel? Now, well, I saw the condition Buster was in. I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, um, look, this is what you have to look at. And I'm trying to find a way because I know I'm mature enough to say this in a way that's not offensive. You know, um, I don't know why it's this way. I understand why it's this way. And I think um, life is not fair when it's this way. It's just some guys, um, some guys got different kind of characters and bloodlines. Some guys, some guys think this stuff is not worth nothing, but money ain't worth dying. And then some people think this box of stuff is worth dying for, you know? And when you come in, you know, when you come in to fight for the championship and you come, you come look decently prepared. You don't come like you look like you want to lose. And at that particular night, Buster came like he looked like he was. It didn't look like he trained one day. Did it look like he trained one day? He blamed it on the, on the Don King lawsuit. You stepped in the ring with Holyfield. Were you confident in the same way you were confident with Tyson? Or was it, you know, I'm not, I should have trained harder, I should have been more focused, and now I'm in a little bit of trouble? 
Well, you know what? I trained hard, but it was just I only had maybe four or five weeks, you know, between going to court and then settling. And then it was like, bam, we, we got this date and this is all the time we got to prepare. You know, so it was pretty, it was pretty, a lot of stuff was going on. Getting well, listen, when you do that, you say, well, let me, give me some more time. I am nowhere I'm going to take the boat, strip me, but give me some more time. Yeah. You know. What, what, did you see what happened uh, with Buster after that fight? He got beat, but what happened after? Well, he gained, I think he got up to about 400 pounds. Oh, yeah, he was sick, huh? He got diabetes, mm -hmm. and he fell into a diabetic coma. And he said at that point, he realized that, okay, he got to turn his life around or else he's going to die. So what do you think? You know, you know my back history and everything. You've seen everything happen to me. Yeah. You're looking at it. It's the first time you ever interviewed me, huh? Yes. And I'm beautiful, aren't I? Gorgeous. No, I'm serious. You're in great shape. No, no, but you didn't expect me to be the way I am with you now, did you? Uh, no, not really. No. Very gracious, very friendly. But I was just saying, um, but um, five years ago, you could say, well, probably this guy ain't going to be around too long. No, I didn't think that. Well, you could have thought that. You didn't know me back then. You no, no. But but really like I said, it. when I when I saw you doing Mike Tyson's mysteries and and doing the Broadway show, I would have never done that stuff business. if I never got married. I would never been involved. My wife always thought this, and even when I, I was I was old dear, I always believed, and she was saying we're gonna do shows. She acted like nothing was happening. She said we're gonna do shows, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do some other shows, we're gonna do some international shows, we're gonna write shows, we were gonna open a corporation, and um, look where we at. This is my bar, this is my office. This is one of my office. I got two more down there. Yeah, well, I've I've rarely seen a successful man that doesn't have a strong woman by his side. I just haven't seen it, whether it's his wife or like a very serious girlfriend. Uh -huh. Guys that are just off flying by themselves usually make bad decisions because they don't have anyone to really talk their ideas through. I'm, I'm the same way. Well, I know this about my wife. This is what I know about my wife. This is the only thing I know about my wife. I don't know who she's sleeping with, who can't she be with him, but I know this, that her whole existence is me and the kids, my other kids too. And as long as I know that, she can do whatever she wants. Right, because someone's wife is, I feel like, the only person that doesn't have an ulterior motive. If you win, they win. No. If you lose, they lose. The right along that, the The reason that we, do you know why, the, know why we have a mate, know what the reason that we have mates for? For we can, for we can know that we're men. Yeah. The only reason we can know that we're men is that we have a woman. Yeah. Other than that, we can't, we can't justify for being a man. So yeah. they justify us for being who we are. And we don't want to give them that credit. That's what we're not going to give them. <laughs> but that's the truth. But we're not going to give them that. We're not going to give them, we're not going to let them know. We're not going to let these bros know they make us. Right. We ain't going to let them know that. We ain't going <laughs> to never let them know that. Even if we tell them that, it's a fucking lie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Mike. <laughs>